Yeah, I was in a club last week and I let my guard down and I said, yeah, I'm gay. And it ended with me getting about 30 seconds of abuse. So it's a relief when you get to wherever you're walking to and you haven't had abuse hurled at you. He comes up to me, he goes, oh, are you gay? And I go, yeah, why am I giving off that vibe? And he was like, yeah, you are. You know what happens to people like you in my country. And I was like, Jesus. Hello, welcome back to Two Pals on a Pod, episode 32. This week, it is our big gay episode. It is, of course... Pride Month, and as a result of that, we thought, why not? Why not get in involved, indulge in that? This was my idea. It wasn't, you know, even though Toby is gay, this is this was my idea. I'm taking this one. Okay, I'm taking all, all the sort of responsibility for this podcast because I thought it'd be an interesting one to discuss. There's lots to talk about, lots of things um, for us to, to chat about. And also, you know, we like to chat about lots of different things on this podcast. Next week, it's going to be Ted Bundy. This week, we're talking about Pride Month. I want to know about your experiences and that kind of thing. It's going to be an interesting one. It's going to be nice, isn't it? It's going to be a th- th- reminiscent of a conversation that you probably have with your granddad that doesn't really understand anything about being gay. You have to explain even the most basic kind of gay principles to him. So what I imagine do, with some then? of these questions that you've got lined up. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't it just mean happy? Isn't gay happy? You know, <laughs> Questions like that, maybe. But yeah, this this is this was your idea, wasn't it? It wasn't my idea. Mainly because I didn't know it's Pride Month this month, because I thought it was in August. Because we both from Leeds, Leeds Pride, like the Pride Parade, when we do get to push our big fat gay agendas. No, that's not a euphemism. It's always in August. So I thought Pride Month was in August, and it is in fact June. So well, for me, it's every sure. month. Yeah, exactly. I only knew because um, a lot of the corporations started changing their Twitter profile pictures to have like mm. rainbow motifs running through them, them, because that makes the difference. So I did presume that, that because Mercedes had changed their logo to a, a Pride flag, mm-hmm. that maybe it was Pride Month this month. And, you know, we, thanks to Mercedes for that, for showing support. We should do that on our socials, which you can follow at Two Pals on a Pod <laughs> on Twitter and is it worth Is it worth you taking the time out of your busy week to uh, put rainbows on our, our little socials? Maybe you should maybe, maybe. You should do that to launch the pod this week, mm. Change the uh, do a full campaign and change the logo on the Twitter. I love that. Um, but yeah, I thought it would be a good, a good podcast uh, to, to chat about this particular topic. I, I first of all want to start right at the beginning, right at the beginning here. And I want to know, at what point did you realise that you were gay? Was was there a moment? Was there like a, oh, I like guys? Yeah, I think, not. I don't think many people, many gay people will be able to resonate with my story because I was exceedingly stupid and naive in the sense that I remember watching High School Musical, the first one, uh, the best one, uh, when I was in year six or something like that. And I remember having the fattest crush, like retrospectively on Zac Efron. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, the guy back then was a hunk. Before he had the work done, the fake jawline. Then I, wow, that would be He was a hunk, wasn't he? Uh, not to play into his body dysmorphia or anything. Uh, <laughs> Nobody do that. But I just didn't connect the dots between being attracted to men and being gay, which I mean, this may be how it should be, isn't it? And then I remember, yeah, having dreams about Zack and Cody, um, which was which was weird. But I was, I was their age at that point. So, I mean, that was okay. But I still didn't kind of connect the dots and then I had this weird obsession in uh, in high school with Gary Barlow I don't know if you remember that mm-hmm. there's a time where we were doing a, a, a powerpoint presentation in physics or something and I stuck a picture of Gary Barlow in every slide of this physics powerpoint about inertia which is like the principle behind like seat belts, isn't it? Inertia, yeah. apparently. But were you attracted nothing... to him though? Yeah, I'd say I still am. I say he's oh, up there okay. with Johnny Depp on the, the highest kind of age range I'd go. Really? Uh, and, you know, I don't know how old Gary is. He's definitely north of 50, I'd say, uh, mm. even though he's had a bit of work done. But I definitely, I still would go there. And then I think the final straw was in sixth form becoming obsessed with Sean Mendes. Um, so definitely got a type because there's nothing that unites Gary Barlow, Zach Efron and Sean Mendes really. Mm. I suppose I was just gagging for it, but I didn't fully realise until I was on holiday in Greece. And it was the first time I'd encountered another kind of gay couple, really. You know, my parents don't have any kind of gay friends. I never really saw them out and about or whatever. And I was on holiday when when we were in Greece and I was about 16, 17. And then I was like, oh, so that's the thing that, that that can happen, is it, you know, two men together. And from then on, I, I downloaded Grinder, and I never looked back. It was quite a seminal moment on that so holiday that was, when that I was, was like... That was like, oh, this is possible. This life is possible. Yeah. When I saw them floating on the... They were sharing a lilo, floating, like, paddling around on the pool together. And it was then that I realised that, it was, that it, was, it was possible. You liked the look of that, basically. You're like, oh, it's, I quite like that, that. That's the life that I'd want. Basically, if I wanted to float on a lilo with another person, it would be a man and not a woman. And that's when the penny dropped. And that is the es- essence of, uh, of, of homosexuality for me. And so was that 16 uh, or 17? What was that? Yeah, 16, 17, I'd say 17, if I had to put an exact number mm-hmm. on it, they were in the like, sixth form. And around that time, people were asking. I do remember. But like I said, I never lied. I always said no because I didn't think I was because I just didn't connect the dots between being attracted to men and then being gay until that age there when I was on when I was on holiday. 
um, that people would ask in the most kind of accusatory tones. I don't know whether that was me taking it a particular way, but we come from a time where I don't think now people use gay as an insult, but when we were in school, it was thrown around quite liberally, wasn't it? I'm probably using it myself. Willy nilly, <laughs> if you'll find the pun, if you'll find the pun. So obviously it had negative connotations and obviously you have that internalised homophobia at that age. But yeah, I realised then and then four months later, got a boyfriend. So we never really looked back from from that from that moment quick, on the lilo. Quick. At what point did your family become aware of that? So the New Year's Eve of that year. So I'd say about, we were on holiday in the summer. So three or four months after that, I came out on New Year's Eve. I didn't mean to. I was drunk, stumbling back from a house party uh, with them. And I was like, Mum, Dad, I've got something to say. And they guessed it. They were like, are you gay? And I was like, yeah. So they kind of took the shine off the moment for me. Oh, they stole your moment. They they did. That my big kind of moment that I was going (laughs) to... I'd hired like a cabaret band to come out as well to announce (laughs) it, obviously. And they they took that moment away from me. Um, I think my mum mum tried stirring the pot a bit, though. My mum tried stirring the pot a bit because my... Dad went quite, he was quite quiet, but he's obviously just reflecting upon things. And my mum was like, oh, so, you know, haven't you got anything to say then, you know, to my dad, like no GM or anything. And I'm thinking, is she trying to prod the butt here? And he said the sweetest thing. He said, well, he's still Toby, isn't he? And that's, right. I've never had any, never had any grief from them or from any family members about being gay. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't have asked for a more perfect re- response to that. And so that, that was literally it then, was it just in, in the street, walking back, and they went, did they say it before you said it then? Yeah, yeah, they preempted it. I said, Both at the same time? You're gay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly, you're gay. Both yeah. of them said that, both of them preempted it. Whilst we're um, singing Mamma Mia back back home. Yeah. Well, that was it. I um, For one of my birthdays, I think I was about 16, I was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, can we go down to London to the West End to watch Mamma Mia on, on stage? Mm-hmm. And my mum's boss said, you know, when she told him, she was like, are you sure he's not gay? And my mum was like, oh, no, I've asked him before. He said, he said no, because I didn't know. So it's, it's a case of everybody knowing before I did, because obviously, like, as much as we hate stereotypes on this podcast, I do think sometimes they exist for a reason. And the whole musicals, Abba, Mamma Mia, is something that I think as gays firmly have a stranglehold over. And it must be for a reason, because... I went to go see them when I was 16 for, uh, for my birthday or whatever, not even knowing I was gay. Mm. I mean, I, I was always history. like, I guess, um, I guess I was like 50, 50 that you probably were like, you know, sort of, you know, for, for quite a few years before then, but it was never like a big thing. Like, I don't, I don't no. really see why people made a big thing, but even like when you, you know, you reference there, like when people used to say um, gay and, and say like a negative thing, I never like understood that. I was never part of that sort of culture, but it absolutely was a thing. Like very normal. Basically, everybody did it, but I never, never got it. Never understood that, and I just, just didn't seem like you know somebody likes guys. Like who cares? I like, it didn't really seem like a big deal. And so, you know, even though I was sort of like 50-50 myself as to whether you were or not, like it was just never a big deal. Like it was not something I thought to ask about or anything. Yeah, I think. For me, the whole kind of principle of coming out is a bit outdated and it was bewildering for me even at the time because save for the the family kind of coming out process, I never came out to you or to any of my friends or anything. I just got a boyfriend, you know, and that is how that's how it should be. It's not how it is, because obviously if people are feeling the need to ask those questions about it and probe, then obviously it's like as if it's abnormal or something that is it's obviously not as common as being straight. But it's not necessarily notable because things like that don't matter. It doesn't matter who somebody's attracted to mm. or whatever, as long as they're not attracted to children, because then they should be on a register. Well, generally, yeah. Generally, generally good we, we don't endorse that. We don't endorse that good behavior. We came so down, we came so hard on uh, Jimmy Savile, came down so hard on Jimmy Savile that we've got to keep a consistent line on paedophilia. Every podcast. Uh, but nothing to do with gays, though. Nothing to do with gays. Mm. So moving on from that, we want to, you know, there's, there's a distinction there. But I never felt the need to come out. It's a bit egotistical, actually. So I'm surprised I didn't kind of get involved in it and like yeah. make a big thing of it and kind of I make it my personality. I thought your coming out story would be like you standing on a chair, like declaring it at like a family <laughs> event or something. That's what I thought. No, no, it's a very, very hush hush thing. I just didn't, I didn't get like the hype around it or anything like you know when it was, it was around the time as well when youtube was posting like coming out videos and i remember i never watched them like troy savant did it didn't he mm-hmm. and i never i never watched and i never, never engaged with any of that but they were like 15 minutes long and i'm thinking how are you taking 15 minutes to explain the fact that you're gay and you're attracted to, Do to a men vine, for god's sake Do a vine. <laughs> Jesus. that's very much of that time isn't it there's people yeah. there's people nowadays that are 
that I fraternise with that don't get any Vine references whatsoever. They were post Vine, so I think we show our age with that, don't mm. we? And their equivalent is probably TikTok, isn't it? Yeah, there definitely was that era. I mean, quite a few years back, I used to see it all the time. It used to be like every day on on Twitter, like someone would be coming out like, "Oh, I'm bisexual," "Oh, I'm, I'm gay," "Lesbian," whatever. Whereas I don't really see it as much now. Sometimes you see it more with like celebrities, like for example, footballers lately and that kind of thing. I mean, a couple mm. of footballers, a couple of referees, that that kind of thing, but. Aside from that, I don't really see this much down the time. I used to be quite prominent, like maybe 2015, 16, maybe something like that. Yeah. It used to be quite a prominent thing, but it's going less and less frequent, perhaps because people feel like they just don't need to as much now, which yeah. is kind of which is a good thing. Like that, that's where we should be getting to. Unfortunately, there are areas of our society like football where it's just not like an openly spoken about thing. And so that's why that's thing still happening in its own sort of time there. I'd hate to say that I was a trailblazer in not really mm. seeing the need to come out. But yeah, it was when when I came out, it was a thing, and I just didn't see the need for it to be a thing, and now it's not a thing. I do remember um, your New Year's tweets, though. I remember those. Yeah. Like, yeah, I remember, I remember being at a New Year's party and seeing that you tweeted something on like New Year's, be like, "It's a New Year, so it's time." And like some yeah. drunkardly drunkard state or something. It's time. I to- think that the funniest thing about that is, I think that that tweet was the year before I actually came out. Was it? Oh, all right. So I didn't, I didn't even, I, I was obviously considering it, but I didn't know for sure at that point. And obviously I had a few bevs as you do on New Year's Eve, but we were rude not to at that age. A few J2Os, a few schlup, uh, you know, sugar rush went to my head and I tweeted that. And I remember tweeting it and waking up the next morning because I think I deleted it fairly swiftly. Yeah. And I was considering it, but I still wasn't 100% sure. And it's not something that you want to, you don't want to come out and then have to go back in again, do you? Because then you get labelled an attention seeker, uh, which I'm definitely not. Um, no, definitely. But I remember a few, a few people seeing that and it, get, it got a few likes. And I'm thinking, this, is, this isn't the way I want to come out. And also, I'm not even sure, man. I'm not even sure that I actually am mm. gay. But yeah, it just shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a big kind of uh, event. And so and when, you say, when you say you weren't sure, what was it the questions, what, what sort of questions were you asking yourself then? Was it purely just, am I attracted to guys? Or was it, am I attracted to guys and girls? Like, what, what sort of questions were you asking? Yeah, it, all of those questions. And it was kind of like, can you see yourself long-term with a guy in the future type thing? And I think that with my upbringing being as it was in terms of our school, there weren't that many people at our school in our year that were open. In fact, I don't know if there were any at all, to be honest. I didn't really take an interest. There were people that you could look at and maybe guess, you know, you're deploying your stereotypes and be like, yeah, maybe they are kind of, gay shall we say and they maybe turned out to be gay you know like i said stereotypes maybe exist for a reason but for me it was kind of like i wasn't exposed to it because i was so into sports so football running and cricket and things like that and like you said there's no exposure to kind of gay kind of role models in in that Mm -hmm. so i was kind of socialized into thinking that the right thing to do would be to grow up and to see yourself with a with a woman because i remember having conversations at school about how attractive certain women were as in like celebrities we weren't perving on the playground or whatever lady gaga um, not really a sign of uh, of heterosexual you know if somebody says i love lady gaga they're not necessarily straight are they yeah, really? no, um, that's what i was going at <laughs> yeah i'm not a fan of her music anyway so well, that's why sometimes stereotypes fail um, maybe she was born this way but yeah but with the with the, with the realms that i was kind of um brought up in for me, it was a question of, you know, feasibly seeing yourself with a guy in the future because that wasn't normal to me. Now it is. Now it's my lived kind of reality every day, you know. I'm uh, looking for a husband. But back then, I, it just wasn't something that I thought was possible. So I was like, yeah, maybe take a step back. And like, am I actually attracted to men or what? Like, And uh, to be fair, like, and phases do exist as well in terms of, you know, sexuality is a spectrum that you can kind of move along. It's kind of a fluid kind of thing. Explore yourself. Um, well, I mean, you're 100% straight, I think, mm. are you? What do they call it? Super straight, ultra straight, something like that. Is what you're they've got their own. They've got the. Yeah, they've got their own flag, haven't they? Have they? It's got a swastika. It's got a swastika on it. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I wanted to ask about, though, is obviously you say that you didn't know until about maybe 17, 16, 17. Do you think that affected your own personal growth? Because you've got to bear in mind, a lot of the people around you are obviously going to be straight. They sort of know already who they're attracted to that kind of thing but you're obviously still clearly figuring it out a little bit until like 16 17 do you think that yeah. put you behind your sort of peers in that sort of growth with those things because maybe they were having relationships or sleeping with people of the opposite sex whereas you were obviously still understanding yourself that kind of thing do you think it set you back maybe a little bit in that sort of uh, development yeah i'd say definitely i think in terms of like if you are like a amalgamation of your previous experiences if that makes sense especially when it comes to relationships mm-hmm. like you learn lessons from your failed relationships even at 16 17 that you apply to your, the relationships that you find yourselves in in the present day type thing so if if if, if straight people in school are out there assured in their sexuality and no openly dating people 
they're using experiences from their previous relationships and their relationships down the line to make those relationships more solid, mm-hmm. I think. And obviously I had a, a late a late start, and that wasn't too late, but I think my first relationship mm-hmm. when I was, was when I was uh, 18, turning 19, which is, I think is comparatively late compared to people in school, shall we say. So there's there's a definite, like, that. I think there's a definite kind of, I think some people reach a point, they've explored their sexuality enough or, you know, explored the opposite sex enough that they get to the point where they want to, say, settle down. Instead of having their cake and eating it, they get kind of sick of that. But, you know, if you start dating around in, you know, year eight or year nine, then the novelty of it kind of wears off. You know, the novelty of, yeah, well, you know, I can kiss her if I want to. And then you get to a, a later age and it's all, I've slept with her, I'm sleeping with her, sleeping with her, whatever. I think for me, maybe I developed at a later stage with that where I'm still kind of in a phase where I want to, have my cake and eat it because I lost out on that when I was 16, 17, 18. Because mm-hmm. um, that period is quite a big thing for for young for some young people. It wasn't personally for me, but for some yeah. young people, that that is a, like a period of time where they do do a lot of that kind of thing, like sleeping around yeah. and sort of exploring, like you say, their sexuality in that sort of sense. Yeah. And so if you haven't quite had that, I mean, like, like I say, you weren't really, really late, but even like not knowing until you were sort of 16, 17, it's quite yeah. different if you're sort of straight and you probably know by like 10, maybe 11, 12, yeah. as, as soon as you know the concept of that kind of thing, then you probably know by that point. So it can, I guess, sort of, you know, um, push back your development a little bit in that area of your life, which is sort of yeah, understandable. I, I think like, like I said, if you're putting yourself out there from a young age, then you're getting that kind of external affirmation, even in year eight, year nine or whatever. And it's nice mm-hmm. that you like that. But then it gets to a point where you get sick of that and you want to say, settle down with somebody. And I didn't have that in, in, in school where I was getting that external affirmation because I don't think there was a particularly broad pool to pick from. And like I said, I don't remember any openly gay people. There were people that you could probably have guessed, but there were no kind of openly gay people. And I mean, even if I knew at that point, would I want to be the, the only one in the year to come out and say and make a show and like a song and a dance of it and be proud of it or whatever? Mm-hmm. Like it's quite an isolating kind of uh, experience. And we touched on it in the, the mental health podcast where nobody really spoke about their mental health either. And it would have been quite a revolutionary thing for somebody to come forward and say, this is what I'm going through. This is what I'm suffering. But I went to kind of painstaking efforts to hide the mental health things that I was going through in, in, in high school. And I dare say the people that knew they were gay at that point, because I didn't, but the people that did probably went to painstaking lengths to kind of hide that or act as if they were something that they weren't, or at least brush it under the carpet mm. because of the kind of goldfish bowl kind of atmosphere in school where it's all, did you hear X or Y might be gay or, you know, there is yeah, that. who'd have thought it, or maybe the old kind of jibe here and there type of thing. There are those sort of like almost they feel like social consequences almost like that kind of feeling of like you say isolation or being the only one to be you know, x y or z um yeah. but i remember like we had someone in our year who um, i think was came out as trans or was trans and you know even that must have been very isolating for them like to have to have done that kind of thing and to have come out and asked to you know to be called a different name and those those kind of things so you know it was, it was clearly in that scenario was probably quite isolated for that person because i remember yeah. like the euphoria around that been spoken yeah. about and so for, there wasn't really that space for somebody to come forward and, be, and sort of be openly gay in that in that sense either yeah and i think with 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 with, with that person in particular like, it must be so jarring if you're getting kind of misgendered unknowingly because you haven't come out and you're getting called the wrong name and you actually want to be called another name because you actually think you're a male instead of a female or a female instead of a male whereas for me it wasn't really happening where you know if somebody assumes i'm straight it's much less jarring to me than if somebody assumes that I'm female when I'm actually male inside, if that makes sense. So it's much easier for me to kind of fly under the radar with things like that. You don't want to be the subject of that kind of furore because I do remember that exact kind of uh, the person you're talking about and the way that it spread like wildfire across the, the year area when we were just socialising, I think, in the morning before class or whatever. And you look back now and it's not a big deal at all. But at the time it was like it was a celebrity that had come out or whatever, you know, mm. as trans. Um, and that's the way that school is, isn't it? And usually people, you know, some you can't bank on everybody having something positive to say either, I think. And in school, that stuff matters to you, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, do you think education in school should be better around these topics as well? Because I don't particularly remember. I don't think I remember same sex relationships being mentioned. I mean, I barely remember sex education, to be honest. So yeah. never mind, you know, a gay relationship. It bodes well for your first time, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I think the only thing that I remember 
was the school gave out some stickers and the stickers said like some people are gay get over it i remember that actually yeah. um, we had those which, stuck in our planners yeah exactly yeah. which that's performative activism from a young age from us though to be fair um, I remember but the also, around the school though they were all over the place yeah yeah they were they was so you know they, they must have cost a lot but i don't like the confrontational tone of that anyway like some people get, get, over, get it. over it you're not going to make any friends by uh, setting out your stall in that in those terms, are you? But that's the, that's literally the only instance I remember from sex education. There was definitely no same sex stuff. I don't think we ever had classes on what it meant to be gay or to be lesbian, to be bisexual, mm. transgender, or whatever. We just had these random stickers given to us, but no no context behind them. Just stick it on your planner, or stick it on a wall or something, or on a display, and that was it. And there was nothing really beyond that. Obviously, I don't know whether now times have maybe moved on a bit. I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I wonder. At what point would you in what point do you introduce that though into the education system? Because I think like in terms of talking about the relationships, same sex relationships, I think you you can talk about those things at, to primary school kids. Like if you do sex education at ten, which weren't what I did at you know I think we were in year six, then you can talk about relationships in that sense. You can talk about like same sex relationships. I think that probably should be like an age where you can you know just talk about relationships generally, like what relationships can look yeah. like and that kind of thing. But that just wasn't there at the time. I don't no. know if it's as a as a general rule, I think if you're talking about mixed sex relationships, straight relationships, heterosexual relationships, you know, if a child is at an age where they're okay to be exposed to that, then they're okay to be exposed to alternative relationships too. Mm. Maybe even that's poly relationships. Maybe you can have an hour in, uh, in, in year six dedicated to poly relationships. It is all about broadening thinking and also tolerance, because obviously one of my big problems was not being exposed to same sex relationships, not even on TV. Not even on TV. There may have been the odd same-sex relationship in a soap, like EastEnders or something, that I remember seeing. But beyond that, I just didn't think it was feasible. I didn't think it was possible. And when I did that New Year's tweet, when I was 16 or 17, I wasn't sure if I wanted to come out. Like, most of my thinking was on, like, my, I might have these feelings for men. I might be attracted to men. Could also be attracted to women. I just don't know. But is it feasible for me to be thinking long-term about being with a guy? And for me, it wasn't at that point. That's why I deleted the tweet because I just couldn't see it's possible. I think role models are so important. And now we've got a plethora of them. But back then we had we had nothing and we had no teachers teaching classes saying, hey, you know, this is a possibility. And, you know, that was lacking. And yeah, I think because people do often talk about like representation and sometimes people go, oh, God, another old, got a, a gay couple in, or the shoe all this in, the shoe all that in, all yeah. that kind of thing. But it is important, like, like you say, if you're not able to see that sort of you know, who you, who you are or who you could potentially become or that sort of vision for what your life might be and it's very difficult to sort of feel comfortable you know being who you are isn't it it's very difficult with that that kind of thing if you don't have the representation well there's a saying isn't it if you can't see it you can't really believe it and for me that was definitely definitely true in terms of the lack of um, role models out there and things like that so it's quite liberating like coming out and then jumping into a relationship straight away like falling into it happily um, within you know such a small time after coming out it was important to me just to realize that it was actually real that you could actually not settle down because it's far too young for that it still is far too young for that but to be in a relationship with a man like to see that it sounds so stupid but to see that that could actually be possible and then to you know wade into sixth form the next day with hickeys all over my neck you know because I was enjoying my freedom it was all those pent-up years of me yeah. not knowing what I was and not knowing what was possible and then suddenly it all comes along at once and it's like a roller coaster ride isn't it and then that's that's the novelty that is the novelty stage that, that most people go through in year seven or year eight where it's kind of like young love for me that was stunted and for a lot of gay people it is stunted I say back then anyway maybe not now because you've got people coming out quite young now mm. but back then it was definitely stunted and then it was like a whole kind of rush of kind of like look at these new possibilities you know i can sleep with people that i'm attracted to you know they can maul my neck or whatever and i can i'm gonna have to wear a tilt neck into school or whatever blah 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 but i'm still very much right, in, yeah. that, you know, in and out of relationships but still in that stage where you want to make the most of it and make up some kind of lost time with that definitely i think and yeah. that's something that will go obviously with time but it's it's a it's a later stage of development because there was a lack of role models and a lack of a lack of thinking from me, I think, to think, oh, I'm attracted to men. That's a feasible option. I do think that that is sort of clear with with you in in your sort of like life is that sort of um, guess making up for lost time. And I can see it in myself, but for different reasons. But, you know, for, for like I, I can see that definitely how that, that sort of makes sense. You can sort of join the dots backwards to that as to why that would be the case. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is what do you make of when people say that 
being gay is a choice like a choice as opposed to how you were born what what do you make of when people say that kind of thing it's something i looked into to most recently because i was looking and obviously they've they've been searching for a gay gene as if it's going to be there as if they're going to look at a genetic sequence and there's just going to be a rainbow gene there flag. with like a limp a limp wrist and like <laughs> a rainbow above it or whatever like sparkly dancing to kylie minogue and you know i think it's becoming increasingly obvious that Have they found one no 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 i think it's becoming increasingly obvious that it's basically like one big gay cocktail of genes that interact with each other maybe, as opposed to just like one that they can isolate. But obviously it'd be, it'd be, magnific- it'd be magnificent if they could isolate one just to kind of say to those people that say that being gay is a choice, just to be like, actually, no, it's 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 in this gene or whatever. But they haven't. It's obviously just one big gay, like shiny cocktail of, uh, of genes interacting Top with each trail, other. Yeah. Um, I think if being gay was a choice, I don't think anybody would choose to be attracted to men because uh, myself included, they are quite torturous at times but I'm always intrigued to to listen to people because I do think that I enjoy the conversations more with people that I disagree with as opposed to the conversations with people that I agree with and I think that's a politics student in me because I'm always listening for opinions that I don't agree with because those are the most interesting conversations that you could have with somebody because you can change their minds like I've had conversations with people because uh, obviously I say we're quite working class and, and and I mean that in the nicest way and, you know, a few of my dad's friends are, you know, from quite, say, like industrious backgrounds or whatever. And multiple times they've said to him, you know, like, oh, like he's really changed the way Toby's really changed the way that I think about gay people. And I didn't know that they knew that I was gay. Otherwise, I'd maybe approach conversations with them in a much more kind of cautious manner. But I just went and I was myself. And it shouldn't be like that, where people have these preconceptions about gay people. And people really seem to be unhappy when like gay people shove being gay down other people's throats, mm. you know, as if it's not something to be proud of, though, because it is. And it's all part of being part of a community that has been persecuted and has been through this struggle and this hardship or whatever. Then obviously you are going to be overly proud of that, I think. Um, it is that sort of like almost the it goes the other way, doesn't it? If you feel like you've been had that side of you like suppressed for so long, yeah. then when you finally are able to be yourself, it springs the other way. Like it's it's just sort of natural and people got the understanding of that, I think. Yeah, exactly. I think the more that I read about, you know, what's going on, say, at Sto- the Stonewall riots in the 70s or the AIDS epidemic in the 80s and how gay people were persecuted because of that and, and oppressed during that period of time and people saying that, AIDS didn't exist and people saying, well, it doesn't exist and it's a punishment from God or whatever. Um, then you, it does, it riles you up, doesn't it? Because it's, mm. it's bad that you, you put yourself in that time, in that era. And you think if I was around then, I maybe wouldn't get to be myself or I would, but I have to be a much more toned down version of myself or I could be myself, but get beat up by the police or whatever, or I could be myself. And, you know, it was the American government that were coming out with President Reagan coming out and saying that AIDS didn't exist when it's killing off mo- like a lot of large kind of proportion of your kind of community. It really has to that kind of siege mentality, that kind of us against the world like type of thing. So it's something to be proud of, I think, as well. And that's what that's what this month is obviously all about. But for me to be out there changing perceptions of, of gay people, is kind of like a backhanded compliment, I think, isn't it? Because you shouldn't people shouldn't be approaching conversations with me thinking being a bit standoffish you know i hope he's not one of those kind of overly flamboyant all he talks about is being gay thing which i mean is, is what we're doing this week so it's quite ironic isn't it my idea um, so it's, it's allowed yeah it's, it's nice but it's nice to soften people's perceptions of, of gay people but if what they mean by that is he doesn't talk about it a lot and he's not overly proud of it or whatever because that's what they're gleaming out of a conversation with them when i'm purposely toning it down just in case I get battered or whatever, you know, mm. then maybe that is quite a backhanded compliment. But it's it, it's nice, and obviously you know that those there are those people of a certain age out there that 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 hold those kind of preconceptions. And I mean, I think it's hard if, if somebody's not part of a minority or say a woman, it's hard to explain. But I was having a conversation with my uncle, uh, who's Jewish, and I said sometimes it's just the mental toll that comes from approaching every conversation with this idea in the back of your head that. I better turn it down because I'm gay or I better turn it down because I'm Jewish. Or I've been in these situations where I've been in clubs and, I, you know, somebody's come up to me overly kind of heterosexual, shall I say, if I can get over saying that. And they've said like, oh, are you gay? And you wonder, are they asking because they're attracted to me? Or are they asking because they want to launch into some kind of homophobic tirade type thing? And you play it safe and you say no, because you're approaching conversations with people you don't know with that kind of niggling in the back of your mind. Like, oh, yeah, I don't like want to be subject. Kind of thing. Yeah. Exactly. And it's not just a gay thing. I had a conversation with my Jewish uncle about it. And he's like, yeah, I have to be careful with how open I am about who I worship or the religion I follow because he doesn't want to be subjected to, to, 
anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And it's like that when you're a member of a community that's a minority that has been historically persecuted and even in the present day faces prejudice that, you know, it's not as bad as it was, but it's not to say it doesn't exist now. It's not to say I haven't faced it. It's always in the back of your head. You've always got that guard up. You're always acutely aware. Just even just saying in a, in a drunk situation, in a, in a, you know, in a tense situation where there's been drink involved, you're just one turn away from being abused or from mm. being hit. And I've had that, I had that recently in a club, didn't I? I told you about that, that whole experience. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, def we'll definitely get on to onto that at some point, but I, I do just want to, for a, a second, um, I think hone in on that point that you made about like almost having to put on a front kind of thing, like to almost guard against any potential like ramifications of being who you are, like just being yeah. you. And people, other people that aren't gay or aren't part of a minority just don't have that. Like that's not in right. like the back of the head to like, careful can i say this gotta say that how do i get oh do, if you ask about a relationship or a girlfriend like do, do i do i say that i'm gay do i tell them about the boyfriend like kind of thing when you're talking to a stranger or a friend of a friend like when that yeah. conversation point comes up that must be a moment of like can i say that in this setting like is, is, honestly is this person gonna take it it's like an assault on the senses because when the conversation you can see it's going that way and they're about to ask about you and it's a perfectly innocuous question to ask like oh are you seeing are there any girls on the scene for you at the minute or whatever you know, it's a normal question to ask, but as soon as somebody asks that question, you're then scanning everything. You're scanning, you're scanning the person that asked the question. You're scanning people around that might be listening in. You're taking into account how drunk people are, you know, what are their attitudes? Because, I mean, I've, there's been times where you, can, you, you can't help but misjudge it. And when I was watching the Champions League football a couple of weeks ago, I sat there with my mate and a couple of his mates, and one of them was from Russia. You know, I told you, you know, he's a bodybuilder, you know, from Russia. And I sat down and I'm thinking, if the conversation comes on to me, because we're just meeting each other and it's natural for a conversation about girls or whatever to come on to me, because they're like, oh, are you seeing anybody at the minute? And it did. And I had this split second to look around the table and go like, gosh, you know, somebody's for, if he's Russian or whatever, he's bodybuilder and he's military background, maybe it's best to, to hush hush on that. And so what happened was he asked about me and my mate that was sat on the left of me kicked me under the table to be like, don't be open. Don't answer. Cause obviously he knew yeah. I was gay. He was like, mm. don't be honest. Don't open the answer honestly about this because it could take a turn for the worst. And obviously he was very drunk, but also I dare say that I think if somebody holds those beliefs when they're drunk, then when they're sober, they probably hold them as well. So I think it's the drink in that, in that kind of situation, but I got like nudged under the table just to be like, you know, don't. And I mean, that was from my mate. That was my own kind of, my own kind mm. of safety. And, and that's exactly the reason why I wanted to do this podcast, because like, I think people forget to, they don't, of, people aren't very good at putting themselves in other people's shoes. So like, you just think, Oh, if you're gay, oh yeah, just yeah, just shut up about it, whatever, just get on with your life. But you've got to bear in mind the things that people are going through, like on the day-to-day -day basis. Like a straight couple, they don't have to think about holding hands, like walking down the street. Whereas it is something for a lot, maybe not everybody, but for a lot of people, I'd imagine it's in the back of their heads. Can I hold hands with my partner? Little things like that it must niggle away and it, like you say in social situations who am i around what setting am i in how much have they had to drink what could that what could they say what are the offhand comments i wanted to do this podcast for this exact reason so that people can just that, that aren't gay can just sort of have a moment to think oh okay i don't have these these situ i'm not in these situations i don't have these things to think about other people do and just be a little bit more open to that for me that's what this podcast is all about for me is to try and make people understand and put themselves in other people's shoes and i think that's a really important thing because like you must have had those moments where you're sort of like can i hold hands with this person oh, yeah. in a relationship and that kind of thing big time and it's, it's funny you should bring up the hand holding thing because i think that's, that's one of the most frustrating things about being gay to me because if you're taking a leisurely stroll down the street in the morning you know with the guy you're seeing or whatever and you're on the you're on the way for brunch or whatever walking by the river on. you know paint paint a lovely picture and you're holding hands you should be absolutely carefree that should be bliss that should be you know one of the reasons why you're in a relationship you know just that little kind of show of affection in public you know i'm there for you i love you you know hold your hand doesn't matter who's about like this is my display of affection for you right in public and for me it's and i think for most gay people it's characterized by like i i feel it but people that i've been with tend to be even more anxious about it than i am Whereas I don't know how people are going to react to it. And what you're doing is you're walking down the street is you're doing the thing again where you're scanning the scene and you're looking at people walking in the opposite direction. And it's just a quick kind of character assessment, like using those like heuristics, like even like what they're wearing, like where are they from, you know, things like that. How are they walking? Are they in a big group or is it just one of them or whatever? And you're using, you're doing that. So you're not really taking in the moment as you should be with there with your partner. You're preoccupied by looking at who's walking in the, 
the the opposite direction and then as I get closer like I tend to not yield to it I tend to just you know hold hands if the worst happens and the worst happens but as they get closer it just gets more and more tense and then you're like well what are they going to say anything is you know if they're going to say something they'll say it now and then they don't say something and they just walk past them you can breathe a sigh of relief and then you walk past somebody else and then you're going through the exact same process again it's very very tiring and it's something that should be innocuous and it should just be nice and it should just be normal and it's something that is for me is the essence of being in a relationship is that show of affection in public and I've had it before where I've been out walking with uh you know I live in a, a student city basically and I've had it before where I've been out walking with somebody that I've been seeing and it's just you know like dregs kind of stuff like gutter stuff just like oh look it's two gay boys or something which is something that is a, an observation and they've thrown a slur on the end of it you know to make it bite a bit and how do you react to that like I think the best thing is just to carry on walking because it's not something that needs to elicit a response but it's about that emotional uh, reaction that you have because it's, it's implicit in that is the fact that you should feel ashamed and the fact that you shouldn't be doing that in public and it's 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 something that seems so meaningless to the person that's throwing those words out there, that short sentence, those five or six words, the mere observation with a, a slur involved in it, kind of ingrained in it, that have such a profound effect on, on, on people like me and people that are in the gay community. And it's just not fair that those words can yield such an emotional response, you know, and then, then you're thinking the next time you go out, it sticks with you and you're thinking, well, what if we bump into somebody of a similar mindset again? You know, and it's should something- we not hold hands? It's something so simple as holding hands as well. Like this is just, it's like a really basic thing. I wouldn't even say it's a show of affection. Like it's just a signal of, I want, you know, unity. We're together, we're in a relationship, we're together. It's not like you're, I mean, even if you were getting off with each other, like even still, there's not, that's not an excuse to say anything. But I mean, that's, you know, obviously a, a clearly a public display of affection, but you're just holding hands. Like that is just like a very, that's a basic thing in a relationship. Obviously not everyone does it, but like mass majority of people do. That's a show of unity. We're together, that kind of thing. And to have that in the back of the, your head, it, it must just be like such a, it must be for, for some people at least be so sort of stressful. Like you say, to be analyzing people coming in and having to make those quick judgments in your mind because your, your brain is sensing the threat. Where's it coming from? Is there any potential threat here? And like you say, you do have to try and get to a point where you ignore it and just sort of put that to the back of their mind and just try and forget about it. But if you've been through those experiences, it's quite difficult because like you say, they can leave a mark. I think as well, having been uh, through those experiences, like you're a person that either reacts to it one of two ways. I react to it in a kind of stoic kind of, if somebody wants to hold that abuse, it's going to make me even more likely to hold hands in public next time. Because for me, I know and I'm understanding as well of the fact that people that throw things like that around, it means nothing to them. It's not, they're going to say that. And then five seconds later, they're going to forget that they've said it. It's not going to be an integral part of their day. Whereas for me and whoever I'm with to receive that, we're going to think about that and overthink it and be like, are we, should we, oh, do we feel safe? Should we be doing this in public? Something as simple mm-hmm. as holding hands, like you said. So you either have that reaction to it where it makes you more kind of stoic in your belief and your convictions that what you're doing is right and you should keep on doing it. Or you can go the other way and it can bring a lot of shame on you or just fear and it's needless fear. And it's, it's something that should just be so normal. And, you know, that kind of simple act of doing that in public is nothing revolutionary, but it feels like it. And it feels so it's, it's a relief when you get to wherever you're walking to and you haven't had abuse hurled at you or whatever, because it does, it feels like a statement. Something so simple as that feels like a statement in, you know, this day and age. And, and it, it just shouldn't. But you, there's the two ways of reacting. There's like fight or flight kind of thing, isn't it? Like, do we do we just keep on doing it as a show of kind of solidarity? Or do we stop doing it because some people might say this or that about it? And it, I think it's just one of those things that sadly, you just have to accept it happens. And mm. if you overthink it and you're deterred by it, you're kind of letting them win, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely one of those things where I think you've just got to keep doing it. You know, you've just got to keep like not not bowing down. So I always think with those types of people, their sort of punishment is the life that they're living. Like that, that's their punishment at the end of the day. So like, is there's not even any like, um, it's not even like you have to say anything back because that that is no. their punishment. They're clearly living a, such a sad life that they feel the need to do that. Um, but obviously it's very, very difficult. Like it's all well and good saying that, but then if it gets physical and what happens then and all that kind yeah. of thing. And, you know, it's difficult. I mean, you, you said before that you've had experiences of people coming up to you and, and almost, you know, being very intimidating and like saying things in nightclubs and stuff. It's always, to me, it's always weird. And I don't know if it speaks to my ego, but I never know whether they're trying to homophobically like hate crime me 
or trying to make a move on me. You know, if somebody says, somebody comes up to you in a club and they ask if you're gay, I'm thinking, oh, like we could be in here or I'm thinking, well, let's shut down. This is a dodgy situation. Well, um, I bet you some of the people that do it though are probably possibly secretly gay. And, like, oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, the, th- the thing that happened at the, at the start of this year um, which was also with a Russian guy, not the one that I mentioned earlier, but another one. So, I mean, you know, up the Ukrainians and all that lot, because I've had some terrible experiences with the Russians, so to say. But I was just sat in a club or whatever, and this guy comes over to me and asks the question, are you gay? And I say, yeah, am I giving off that vibe? I didn't know it was. I didn't find him particularly attractive. I wasn't flirting with him. But I was like, yeah, I was just sat in the, the smoking area by myself, having a breather. Um, having a breather in the smoking area. My yeah. A breather. <laughs> it explains my smoker's cough that I'm uh, I'm suppressing this week because it, it'd be a ball late to edit out. But I'm breathing in all that tar and rat poison and fumes or whatever. Uh, and he comes up to me, he goes, oh, are you gay? And I go, yeah, why am I giving off that vibe? And he was like, yeah, you are. You know what happens to people like you in my country? And I was like, Jesus. I mean, I do an impression, but it'll sound like Borat. So that'd be offensive. Not in the spirit of this podcast. And I was like, oh my God, like you're take- I'm taken aback by that. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? Where are you from? And he goes, oh, I'm from Russia. And I go, that's lovely. And then I say, uh, a guy I was seeing was from Russia because he was. So once again, another bad experience with a Russian to tot up now. Basically, this conversation went on for about... 25 minutes and he was saying things like you know what would happen if you kissed me and I didn't I didn't like I remember at the time I was absolutely better but I didn't like the where the agency was in that sentence because it was kind of like it sounded to me like a thinly veiled threat because I'm thinking what does he mean does he mean is he going to hit me if I try to kiss him or is he inviting that otherwise why would he be saying that like why is it me kissing him why is he not kissing me I don't want that to happen he was a munter but like, I don't know what the Russian word for ugly is, but that's what he was. But like, I didn't like the way that that agency was going to set up in that sentence because it was sounded threatening to me, basically. Because mm-hmm. it was like, you kiss me, I punch you. But he, it's almost like he was trying to invite that onto him because of the way he phrased the sentence, if that makes sense. And after a while, my friend came over and pretended to be my boyfriend to get me out of the situation. Because as easy as it would be to sit here now and be sit here and be like, I don't know why I didn't get up and leave that situation. It was the fear. I couldn't move. Mm. I didn't want to move. Because then if you move in a situation like that, do you provoke an, a reaction from the other guy? Who I think from what I've heard is closeted as a bisexual or even like full-blown, you know, gay, full-blown, full carrying member of the gay community. Mm-hmm. He's got but a like, flag. Yeah, exactly. But like if he's coming from a background where he's not, he's not allowed to own that flag and he's not allowed to be who he is, then if I just get up in that situation... Does he then feel ashamed? And then does all that shame come back to him? And, you know, he's been knocked back by me. And he obviously viewed gay people as a le- lesser than, than, than a heterosexual person, hence the disdain in his, the way he was speaking to me. So for him to be knocked back by somebody and rejected by somebody that he views as lesser than him, he'd react in a volatile manner to that. So I had to be, my friend came over, pretended to be gay, got me away from the situation. I just started crying because it was one of the most intense situations I'd been involved in at that point because of the fear involved in that. And that was in a club full of students so it wasn't as if I was in Moscow in Red Square or whatever I don't think I'd be that bold it was in it was in a club in a student city and it, it happened then it, it just happened it happens and those are the sort of stereotypically those are the sort of places where you're supposed to feel like the most safe I guess like you know exactly. students around you that kind of thing I mean exactly I mean he's got plenty of friends that are, that are students and that you know that hold these kind of socially liberal attitudes so it's interesting that that, that his views would manifest those uh, themselves in, in 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 that kind of way but I mean I went through the relevant kind of reporting process and obviously the more I reported it and then I got told oh this isn't the first time that he's done something like this so it's obviously a deep issue and it's it's, it's you know he's definitely closeted and that's tough to, to grapple with Mm. yourself and I think it explained why he was phrasing that sentence in the way he did because I think he wanted something out of that but that's obviously not the way to go about it and it made me feel very uncomfortable and you would think that in this day and age in that environment you wouldn't have to face that but you do and I mean, you have to have that guard up you can't let that guard down it sounds like he's battling two different things there which is his own sexuality and his culture's view of that sexuality and that's obviously stirring a lot of anger in him, which is then projecting onto other people. And like you're saying, quite an intimidating way by the sounds of it. Yeah, I mean, there was definitely, I think, the threat of physical violence for a lot of that conversation. That's why I felt like I couldn't move. And that says a lot about me because I'm not somebody that would usually just kind of shut down in those scenarios. But to be fair, I mean, that instance and then an instance again a, a couple of weeks ago where somebody came up to me and they said, are you gay? And I said, no, because I've learned my lesson by now. And he said, yeah, you are. Look at your earrings. And they're just like the most normal kind of Captain Jack Sparrow gold earrings. He's not gay, is he? Well, um, I don't assume. 
And then, yeah, well, you never know. I'd take him on our side, though. I'd take mm-hmm. him on our side. Yeah, nobody would give him shit for being gay. But, you know, I was in a club last week and I let my guard down and I said, yeah, I'm gay. And it ended with me getting about 30 seconds of abuse for the uh, somebody disagreed with the way that I uh, live my life. But then it ended with me knocking two double rum and copes out of his hands and then him coming for me and then getting dragged out by a bouncer quite unceremoniously. So I think we, we we won that one. But that's what I mean when I say that you can't let your guard down. That's what I mean. A slip of the tongue and that's it. You're having a conversation in a club that you don't want in a club because it usually happens in a club because people have had a drink here and a drink there. And that's not what you go on a night out for. And this is why like aggro. This is why people talk about safe spaces and this is why people talk about like, yeah, and that's why they have like gay bars and that kind of thing. That's because of those sort of situations that you talk about. Like they're not obviously, you know, you can only go there, that kind of thing. But it's it's a place where you know for certain or you should know for certain that you are safe in that environment because of, you know, this is a, a gay bar. And so it invites a certain demographic. And yeah. so that's that's sort of the reason for a lot of these places. Like people sometimes sort of you know, go, oh, you know, have sort of like a, that sort of feeling of, oh, like a gay bar. Like, well, why, why do you need that? Or why do you need safe space? And these kind of things, they sort of roll their eyes at it. But there's a reason for it. There, there is a reason for it, unfortunately. And that's because you don't always necessarily feel like you can be yourself in, in every given environment. Like I was saying to you um, a few months back now when we were walking through Leeds, how on Google Maps, there's like an LGBTQ plus friendly thing, which businesses mm-hmm. can tick. Like if they're LGBTQ friendly, I mean, imagine having to have that. We're friendly here, like with a tick next to LGBT for, for yeah, a business to have to tick that. You're welcome it's here. Got, it's a shocking state of affairs, isn't it? When 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 you have to actively go out there and prove that you're not homophobic or mm. discriminate against people just for the. I mean, when you strip it down as well to the basics, it's giving somebody shit for who they're attracted to. Yeah, like it's ridiculous. Why, it's, why do you care? Yeah. It's as futile as the racism and sexism and all those isms that we don't like, isn't it? Like, mm-hmm. it's got nothing. Somebody, what, what somebody gets up to in their personal time, their private spaces, is it's got nothing to do with you. I think it's for me, it's the audacity of it of, of people that say, like the guy to me that said that he, oh, I just don't agree with the way you live your life. That wasn't a personal insult to me because he didn't know me. If he knew me and he said that, I'd probably have said, yeah, I disagree with the way I live my personal life as well. But yeah, I disagree with my lifestyle too. We I mean, all do. Yeah. <laughs> it was I'm on just board a... with him. This, this Russian guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> it was just a general attack on, yeah, I don't disagree with what you get up to personally, but the fact that you're attracted to men, I disagree with that. Your lifestyle in that respect, I disagree with that. Why does it concern you? Who the fuck are you? I don't know whether it's coming from a place of sexual frustration or whatever, but why is he so pressed in a club of all places? That's, why is that on your mind? That's the thing that I, I don't get is when people say, um, oh, well, in my country, this would be uh, against the law or in in my belief system, this is not right. We don't. And it's like, well, OK, that's your belief yeah. system. Enjoy. Right. That's your country. You're, you're in this country. It's legal. This country, the belief system believes that it is absolutely yeah. nothing wrong with it. It's completely normal. So why are you bringing, why, why are you making this about you? It's the arrogance to like be yeah. like, this is your life, but I'm going to impose my rules on it. What? Yeah, like I could understand if I went out to the Qatar World Cup this winter and I took a, a LGBT flag, there should be nothing wrong with that, but there is. And that's mm. just me inciting stuff. Me in a club, I'm not even getting with anybody. I'm not even displaying my sexuality beyond the fact that I've got two earrings in. Which it's like you've got it written gay. on your forehead. Even if you did, no. do it. Go do for it. it. Even if you did. I, no judgment. I wouldn't judge that. There's more than enough space for G-A-Y on this uh, massive forehead, uh, I'd say. That. We could put homosexual on it. I was about to say. I was about to say that. <laughs> could do the extended version in. But yeah, it's, it's just that. Why would I care either? I didn't care. I didn't let it ruin my night. Like, I'm sat here talking about it now, but it didn't... That, particular encounter didn't really have an impact on me that one the one a couple of weeks ago because why would I let it ruin my night and at the end of the day I got one over on him by getting him kicked out you know I didn't get him I didn't grass him in for being homophobic I'm not a grass but I knocked his drinks out of his hand and he started kicking off and got kicked out for that but it is, it's the karma. entitlement why sh- yeah karma if anything I remember looking at the ground and being like there's about eight fifties worth of, uh, of drinks on the floor that's not a bad not a bad hole for me and then he got kicked out bam Full stop. Um, I was. I wanted to ask you. Uh, do you think? Do you find it tough meeting other gay people? Because obviously you are part of a minority a demographic, and yeah. so there's obviously naturally going to be less in in the pool, if you if you like. But there is obviously on the flip side of that, there is now versus twenty years ago. 
things like Grinder and Tinder and other, you know, like ways of de- meeting people and dating people. Um, so do you, do you still find it a bit of a struggle or is it more the in-person thing where it's a struggle of being like, I don't know who in this club is gay? I remember having a conversation with a couple of friends in, in second year when we were in our living room back then in that house. And they were straight and they'd met in, in, in the Freshers' Week and it was a chance encounter where they happened to live on the same corridor whatever you know that's how most relationships i suppose blossom especially mm-hmm. back in the day it was you know all organic this and organic that and they were saying i still see the appeal of, 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 of tinder and they were kind of looking down on it and you do get those people that look down on dating apps for some reason even though date uh, relationships that are formed through dating apps have a uh, larger success rate these days than relationships that are formed organically which is something i learned recently mm-hmm. so there's no need for that kind of snobbery but I kind of schooled them on that because I can see their perspective from a, from a straight kind of heterosexual perspective, maybe so. Firstly, though, who cares? Who cares how person mm-hmm. one and person two meet? And that doesn't matter. But I said, these apps actually perform a, a, quite, a quite a pertinent kind of function in terms of gay people or lesbians or bisexual people. Because first and foremost, when you're swiping through there, you know who's gay and who's not. They're all gay on there, right? So there's not the question mm-hmm. of in a club. I would never approach somebody in a club unless I was 100% sure that they were gay. And the only way that I would know that they were 100% gay is if they were a friend of a friend, a friend, or if I'd seen them on Tinder or Grindr or Hinge or something like that. Mm -hmm. So they perform such an important kind of function in terms of, I don't know, and I haven't heard any horror stories of somebody going up to somebody in a club assuming they were gay and then turning out to be straight and then taking offence to that. But that's definitely something that would happen. If there's a straight guy in a club and a gay person goes over or whatever, and try to on with them because they think they're gay, they would probably get some stick back. It's quite a dangerous situation to be in. It's not one that I want to put myself in. So apps like these do perform an important kind of function in terms of knowing who's gay and in terms of forming friendships with people. Mm-hmm. Because for me, with the lifestyle that I had in, in, in high school, the interests I had in high school, they kind of lent themselves to be friends. They lent those interests that I had lent themselves quite aptly to be friends with other guys like straight guys like the football that I was playing and you know things like that so I didn't grow up with many gay friends and we spoke about how there weren't many gay people out at school anyway so the friends that I have that are gay are friends that I've matched with on dating apps and then it's just become apparent after a week or two of talking that this is kind of like a platonic attraction like maybe the physical attraction is still there but you get along with somebody so well that you're on that kind of friendship level and there's three or four friends that I've got that I've made through those apps and even then it's so kind of reassuring to be able to go to them and share these stories that I've shared today about hate crimes and about the general nature of gay men shall we say that it's nice to bond over that that kind of community feel it's important for gay people to have other gay friends and for lesbians to have other lesbian friends and, and vice versa but yeah but they perform an important function in, in in those kind of senses as well so I don't really get why people would ever look down on on dating apps you know because like I'm not going to go to a lecture happen to sit in a random spot and the love of my life walk in and sit next to me because the chances of them being gay, me being attracted to them, them being attracted to me, us hitting it off in terms of like personality and everything like that, are very slim compared to friends that I have that I know that met via random encounters in lectures and seminars at uni and things like that. So and, they're really important at dating apps. And that's why there is a, a, a gay community and like almost like a network because you know then you sort of, oh, so-and-so is gay and this person is gay. And so, because you all then know each other and then that sort of builds yeah. like a sort of network of people where you, where you sort of know Oh, I'm safe with that person, you know, trying to sort of get with that person or whatever, because I know that, that they're gay, that kind of thing. So rather than having that sort of being completely blind to it, you have that sort of interconnected sort of network of, of knowing who's who kind of thing. Yeah, it's a blessing and a curse, though, isn't it? Because obviously it's nice to know who's gay so you don't get your head kicked in if you make a move on a straight guy in a club. But it's terrible because that kind of tight knitted kind of everybody knows each other community feel means that, you know, who slept with who. And you know mm-hmm. that when you sleep with somebody, you're thinking, oh, but I know they got with this person and that this person, you know, the whole kind of history about it all. And you hear rumours, rumours that might be true, might not be true. You don't know. They're just rumours to you and things like that. That can be quite annoying, I think. And then there's people, when, when I had my first breakup at uni, there were people at my uni that were gay, like in the gay, on the gay scene, that knew about it before I did. And so I got a text, oh, sorry to hear about you and Harry or whatever. And I was like, what, what about me and Harry? What do you know? Sorry to hear we're together. What? And then the text from him came through because it's okay to break up with people over text, by the way, as we established last week. His was a little bit uh, delayed, was it? His got lost in the in what in transmission? Did it? Yeah. Is that why it was after? <laughs> I think maybe he didn't have any signal or the Wi-Fi. classic. Oh, sorry, I was asleep. I was asleep for seventeen hours or something. So I decided to tell everyone else before telling yeah. you, Soz. Yeah, no, he didn't actually do it by text. I was only joking. Credit credit to him in person. Broke my Letter. heart. No, that, that is annoying though. 
I can't, I can't stress enough how annoying that is and how annoying it is if you start talking to somebody on Tinder or on Hinge and you're like, oh, you know, I'm enjoying where this is going. Like, what's your Instagram or whatever? And then you exchange Instagrams and you see the list of mutual followers and it's just a big long list of like gay people that you've both spoken to. It's so annoying. You, you just want to be free from all that. Yeah, but, but that can definitely get, uh, get grating mm-hmm. over a period of time for sure when everyone sort of knows your business and that kind of thing. Can we get a bit much? Um, I was curious to hear your thoughts on gay stereotypes, like what your thoughts are on on them, because there's obviously that sort of stereotype growing up of you know a gay person, really flamboyant, Mm. um, as as you said earlier, sort of the limp wrist kind of thing, that kind of sort of you know voice, that kind of thing. It's certain. You're going to get yourself cancelled at this rate. Hopefully, hopefully, (laughs) but that kind of thing. What's your thoughts on that? Do you do you see that as a, a healthy thing? Do you see that as like a way of identifying people? Do you think that's like flawed? Like what's what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think stereotypes are inherently flawed because gay people come in all shapes and all sizes. But what stereotypes are are basically generalizations, broad generalizations made about a particular kind of community. And I'm not going to speak about st- racial stereotypes. Please do, please do. As a white man, I'm not going to start riffing about that. Because you're going to get cancelled. Well, yeah, exactly. I won't be able to sidestep that, uh, the controversy there. But they do exist for a reason in terms of the, the gay community. I kind of get that because it's about what makes a community a community. Because a community isn't a modest block of people, but it's a block of people that recognise that they have certain things in common. And the gay community, like, you can't just reduce it to we're all attracted to men. And that's it. Because you wouldn't get much of a community feel out of that. Like, if you go to a gay club or a gay bar... You expect certain songs to be on the playlist because those songs are kind of gay anthems. Heavy mess. So a bit of Kylie Minogue, ABBA, mm. Erasure, Pet Shop Boys, things like that, Lady Gaga, Charlie XCX, the like. I'm just naming my recent Spotify <laughs> searches. So those stereotypes do exist for a reason, and that's what people bond over. And even though there are a significant portion of people in that society that don't necessarily like that music, the prevailing culture is that. It becomes like the front of those stereotypes. Sort of- the front facing almost like the shop window type thing doesn't it it's almost yeah. like a cartoon it's like a cartoonized sort of version yeah of that, like, isn't it? like a marketized version of mm. this is what being gay means and then you kind of go it's like it's a shop window and then you go in and you realize that there's a whole array of people here. like Very overly people, simplified uh, exactly and that's what stereotypes are and they exist mm-hmm. for a reason in the sense that you go to a gay bar you don't you know you, st- you think of the stereotypes of gay people you will see them but there'll be other people there as well you think of the music that they were stereotypically play, they will play that, but maybe they play some of the stuff as well and it might surprise you. I mean, people are always astonished that I am gay and I like football and they can't really mm. compute that because that's quite a rarity. But that's my kind of, that's my reality. Like, I'm gay and I mm. like football. Like, what do you want me to do about it? I'm not a zoo animal, um, you know. Whereas there's some people that hate football and maybe that's more stereotypically the done thing. I say most most gay people dislike football from my experience. And that's the done thing and that's the stereotype. Yeah, because that, that's so, definitely like the stereotype about guys and sort of like straight men. They all they all love football. Yeah. All of them. And a lot of a lot exactly. of people do. But you know, it's it's again, it's like a, a sort of sweeping statement, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that's what that's what stereotypes are. Like not all straight people have Bad music taste, do they? Or where Lynx Africa, you know, not, not stereotype. All, not, all, not all straight men. Yeah, I think that. Oh, I'm sorry, straight men. Like, I thought you said gay yeah, men. Straight men. No, oh. straight men. Not all straight men know where Lynx Africa. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I, I wasn't aware of that being a big thing in the gay community. Although it's it definitely nice not. Colours on the front. <laughs> I don't know what scent is big in the gay community. Mm. I don't know if Kylie's got anything out. <laughs> no, she doubles in that, doesn't she? Probably does. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the scent is, but, um, <laughs> but in the in the in the straight community, they say, "Oh, you're wearing links after." It's not true. It's just a funny, you know. If, if a stereotype's funny and inoffensive, I don't mind it. I don't mm. mind it. And obviously, within the gay community, you've got a lot of sub communities. Not to get too confused, because I get confused myself. But you have your twinks and your bears and your otters and you know things bears. like that. You know which otters. So just, what's an otter? So an otter. I could get this wrong. I've heard of bears. A bear, a bear is a big built hairy guy and yeah. an otter is a slim hairy guy and a twink is a slim usually white hairless guy obviously hair on the head like mm-hmm. 18 19 20 years old but slim um so you have those and what's uh, a shark a shark <laughs> a shark can be can be gay or straight and is somebody at university in second or third or maybe in fourth year in some cases fifth but- uh, Six, that, that praise that, that praise on freshers people in freshers yeah is what a shark is so i've been told anyway i'm not sure 
you might have to ask one yourself in that. Um, one thing that I, I did want to ask you uh, about your own experience. I mean, do you personally feel comfortable out in public then? Do you uh, just generally like, do you feel comfortable in, in yourself being out in public? By myself or holding hands? So uh, Just in general, just in general, like just by yourself, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I'm comfortable in myself now. I've never received any shit myself. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm not outwardly gay. You know, in, have in you tried to rein that in almost as in as to try and not be like that? Yeah, actually, no, you that's a really good question. So, basically, there was an, a, an instance where quite a niche reference. So, the Leeds United got promoted a couple mm-hmm. of years ago, and everybody went down to the stadium. It was during the COVID lockdown, but everybody went into the, down to the stadium to celebrate outside. The nature, the way that that unfolded was it was quite unexpected. So we weren't actually expecting to go up that day because we were relying on results from other teams, basically, mm-hmm. to not get into the nitty gritty of it. So I wasn't expecting it. And I'd just on that day painted my nails. It was, you know, a bit of self-expression, what I used to do back then. I used to quite enjoy it. I enjoyed the act of doing it. I enjoyed the actual practical kind of side of doing therapeutic. it. Like therapeutic. Yeah. Exactly. I painted them a lovely kind of pastel kind of peach colour. And then obviously we unexpectedly got promoted and everybody was dashing ground down to the, to the to the ground to celebrate. And I must have only done them about half an hour, an hour before. And I made sure that I removed them before going down. Well, I just done them. It didn't make any sense other than mm-hmm. the fact that I didn't want to get any shit in that kind of hyper masculine environment down celebrating the football result. I didn't want to get any shit for having my nails painted. So I had about half an hour after painting them, I removed them and then dashed down to the, to the ground. Uh, so that's an example. That's one example, one kind of overt example of me toning it down. Mm-hmm. But obviously, subconsciously, there'd be other things up there. Be, you know, like if I'm in a com- having a conversation with somebody and I notice that because I'm quite expressive with my hands and stuff and they do go flying in a you know, stereotypically gay way, you, I sometimes look to tone that down. So depending on what environment I'm in. And obviously, you, you, you tone down, you, you adapt what you're talking about as well. And it's, it's quite a good conversational trick to, to deploy anyway in general because you want, the person that you're talking to to be interested in what you're saying so you tailor what you talk about to people so there's things that i talk to you about that i want to talk to the people about because why would they be interested it's got no frame of reference but there's times where i talk to people and i tone down what i'm saying i'm not going to be going down to the pub and talking about men that i'm attracted to to my dad's friends so i tone that down as well but the most prominent example would be the nail polish being removed uh, half an hour after putting it on before going down to the football ground to celebrate the result final thing i want to ask you before we wrap up uh, if you what what do you wish you knew at 18 that you sort of don't know now about sort of or, or what do you wish that you knew when you were younger about the, these kind of things like if for example you had a child and the, the child um, you know was was gay or was you know I guess exploring their sexuality would probably be the best way of, of terming it yeah what would you what sort of advice would you give that younger person well I think a lot of my problems uh, stemmed from not knowing I was gay when it was abundantly clear that I was when I was attracted to men. So I think connecting those dots is so important because I think it's a developmental thing, like we said earlier. So if I'd have realized when I was 13 or 14 that I was gay, then I'd, I'd, I'd have been able to just play the field, which is a horrible phrase, but I'd have been able to play the field from that age where everybody else was kind of playing the field from. Because for me, that's something that's quite important. I feel like I I, that's a, a need that I have. I need to sufficiently play the field before settling down. I don't want to settle down too soon. I know for me, I want to feel as if I'm exploring options out there and then you suddenly land on a preferable option and then you follow that or whatever. But because I didn't have those formative experiences in school, because I wasn't to know, I didn't connect the dots. I was obviously behind on that developmentally. So I think I'd focus more on that because you can never control the attitudes of other people. I would never say, I would never say to my hypothetical kid, you know, who happens to be gay or, or lesbian or whatever. Like if you're out with your boyfriend or girlfriend, make sure you don't hold hands. That's not in my mentality to do that. If anything, I'd advise them to do the opposite and be like, make sure when you're out there, you do hold hands because it's a statement and it's not what those people want you to be doing. And it means it means absolutely nothing to somebody to throw an insult out there uh, and it comes from a place of miseducation. So focus on the things that, that you can control, which is just knowing. But it's, it's it. everybody's at different stages on that path. And I think that now, like there were, way more LGBT kind of plus people in my sister's year at school than they were in ours. And she's only 
five years younger, six years younger. So obviously the culture around that has changed. There are more role models now out there where younger people are obviously thinking, yeah, that, that's I could be I could be gay potentially. It's actually it's almost become trendy to be gay. People that are trying to jump on it, yeah, it's people that are trying to jump on it, you know, in a way. So people are very eager to do that. Whereas I lack the role models, and I didn't know it was possible, which is quite stupid. Got a bit trendy, yeah. It's annoying, yeah, right? it's like it's like Crocs, Crocs are back in as well. Crocs used to be hated. I love the pipeline from between hate, Croc hater to Croc lover. I love that. And it's similar with the gays. It used to be horrible. You know, being gay was you meant you were a social outcast. And now it's actually pretty cool. Everyone Join us. It. Everyone's on the bandwagon. Start, start pushing the gay agenda. Join us. Join us. I mean, that's good to hear, though, that people, it seems like things are improving then. I mean, you say there that there was um, a lot more people in your, in your sister's year that are uh, LGBT. And that sounds like things are therefore improving, like things are sort of making some progress on that level, do you think? Yeah, well, parallels with what we said about mental health, where it seems that we weren't at school that long ago, relatively speaking, and things have improved so much since then. And it's the same with respect to uh, LGBT kind of exposure and awareness. I think the fact that more people are feeling as if they're more comfortable to come out can only be a good thing because there were people in our year, including myself, that were LGBT plus that didn't come out. Uh, so it's nice that, that the people feel that way now. It's such a shame, though, that you still get people that sort of roll their eyes or go, oh, you know, that kind of thing at the thought of like people just being themselves, like being comfortable being themselves. Like it's that sort of thing that people feel the need to get involved with other people or that people just being themselves is like an issue for them. Uh, it's just such a shame that there are still those segments of, of our society. But like you say, it does, it does seem like things are moving in the right direction. I think it's a shame because I think there's there's two types of people that come to mind. There's the people that are older that were raised in a different generation that are not necessarily comfortable with the existence of gay people because mm. it's not what they're used to. It's not what they we used to when they were brought up in their kind of formative years. It wasn't something that was viewed as normal back then. So those kind of societal attitudes can take a while to change. And then you have the people, the people that I've encountered in terms of when I've got shit for holding hands in public or those two instances that happened in the clubs. Those were people our age. And maybe the, the you know, the two Russian guys, that's a kind of societal thing as well because they were brought up in Russia. Very macho culture, definitely not okay to be gay there. In fact, illegal, I imagine. That's a shame. Shocking. Shocking. But get when with they the got times. that, when, I don't know, get with the, get with the sense of Vlad. Mm. Yeah, struggling maybe with maybe he's though. gay. Maybe. Maybe. Somebody check his wrists. Somebody check mm, his wrists. Please, please you do report know. back. Yeah. I wonder like if he'd closet. be in, would he be an otter, a bear? He's probably the daddy. Question. I mean, I've Bloody seen the, the way daddy. he rides a horse. He's definitely got, you know, a bit of sort of chest hair there. I don't know. He likes rolling around daddy. with the guys. Loves a bit of karate. Loves rolling around with, with the, men. A bit of male on male contact he loves. And with those Ooh, broad shoulders. That's it. Yeah. Throw me to the ground. Throw me to the <laughs> ground. Go on. I'm filing that one under words I thought would never leave your mouth. You big bear. Yeah. I think he'd be a daddy. Vlad the really? dad. He'd be Vlad the dad. Yeah, he's mm. definitely got that complex. But those people, when I got the, the the hate crime on the street from a guy who I think I presume was English from his accent, but he was, he was a Geordie, so you can't really tell. He, I just thought I pitied it more than anything else because it's, that's not a societal thing in terms of generations or in terms of culture. It's more a miseducation type of mm. thing. And also, I think you have to be leading a certain sort of life to be out there seeing a gay couple on the street and giving them shit like he's obviously not happy there's some kind of internal kind of angst there mm -hmm. whether it's frustration at his own circumstances i don't think he's closeted by any means but in terms of like where he is in society mm -hmm. then that is quite sad that there's that people have those kind of frustrations with their own lives and they're not leading very happy lives and they take it out of the people and that's what i that's what I saw with that. I saw kind of a, a toxic kind of cocktail of miseducation and unhappiness. And I pitied it in a way. Maybe I shouldn't have because what he said was, wasn't was very nice. But you have to pity it, I think. I think everybody's a product of their own experiences and their environments. And that's the case with a lot of abuse, whether it's um, against somebody's sexuality or racism, whether it's just abuse in general online or something like that. Often it does come from a place of frustration and anger at their own circumstances that they then reflect on other people. Like you never find somebody who's really happy in their life, really happy, content, you know, life's going, abusing people. Like that, yeah, that exactly. just doesn't correlate. Like that's just not a correlation. Nobody that's satisfied with with the way that their circumstances are, their life is feels the need to ex like it's 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 projecting in a way, isn't it? I don't like the way that my life is, mm -hmm. so I'm going to try and make your life, try and ruin your day. I'm unhappy. Four or five nasty words on the street. I'm, 
unsatisfied with my own life, my own lifestyle. Yeah, and, and you almost out yourself as someone who's living a sad life by doing that, as well as the abuse, which is obviously aimed at trying to hurt someone else. Yeah, exactly. I think it, it's everybody's a product of their own circumstances, their own environments, and it doesn't necessarily excuse it, but it, it helps you understand it. And I think if you're if you're subject to abuse like that, but you understand where it's coming from, it 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 makes you a bit more comfortable with it because you're not asking you don't think it's senseless you're not asking you're not thinking why did he do that why you know I'm, I'm really hurt by that why did he feel the need to do that you understand the context of the comment and it's not okay you pity it because you're not in that situation where you're feeling the need to go out there and abuse people so it actually puts you on the higher ground like way higher ground like you actually I feel sorry for, for people that feel the need to do that and they go out there and do that and that's a nice place to be I think I'd rather be yeah. pitying somebody than being pitying myself and that's a really good point I think to try and approach it from like a, a place of understanding understanding not in a sense of accepting because we know it's unacceptable yeah. but again just almost trying to be like yeah I what you're what you're saying or doing is wrong quite clearly but I imagine there's a lot of things that have led to that position and like you say, it's a lot of like miseducation and things going unchallenged in households and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I think, I, listen, if we could make even the tiniest difference in terms of attitudes, then it'll be a job well done for us. I've really enjoyed having the kind of platform this week to, to speak about my experiences. You asked some probing questions as well that were very mm-hmm. kind of nail on the head. And it's not something that we discussed or conferred about beforehand, but you were asking all the right questions and pushing all the right buttons as well, which shows that obviously you understand as well a lot and it's really interesting to me that you thought I was 50 50 in in school because I oh it's not something that I was thinking about myself until when I was mm-hmm. 16 or so so it's weird that other people were thinking and looking going you know it could be could be a bit could be a friend of Dorothy yeah as the saying goes I mean, probably know, about year know. nine I reckon something like that like that was probably when I was like oh yeah yeah, I was sort of more leaning towards you probably were but like it was never a really big deal so there you go so the, the note we're going to end on is that you knew that I was gay before I did. And so that, that gives you ultimate authority in everything we have discussed and anything we will discuss from here, because you know me better than I know me. Exactly. So all the topics that we talk about week in, week out, you know best. Exactly. And on that note, we'll end things here. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Really do appreciate it. Please go ahead, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button as well. I'm trying to push towards 500 subscribers. So if you can help us out in that pursuit, that'd be great. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. See you later.